She is more to be helped than despised. She is only a lassie who ventured down life's stormy path ill-advised. Do not scorn her with words fierce and bitter. Do not laugh at her shame and downfall. For a moment, stop and consider that a man was the cause of it all. <laughs> yeah. So that is one way that people living in Los Angeles in the 19th century might have interpreted the details of the Hattie Wolstein murder, but as our speaker will undoubtedly uh, describe this evening, um, the dynamics of gender and class created a far more nuanced and complex response uh, from 19th century uh, Californians. Um, so, uh, my name is John Jackson. I am the head of outreach and communications for the library, and on behalf of Dean Christine Brancolini, welcome to our second faculty hub night of the 2018-2019 season. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of administrivia. So this is faculty pub night, but it is not faculty only, as you've already discovered. And it's faculty pub night because we are celebrating faculty publications. <laughs> Now you know the joke. Um, we are in our ninth year of this series, and this is a way for us to celebrate the creative and scholarly works of the faculty here at Loyola Marymount University. Um, you'll notice already that you have feedback forms on your chair. Um, if you would please fill those out before you leave this evening. Thank you, Dean uh, Brankelini, for modeling those. And put them in the little plastic box over here on the counter that lets us know what you learned from this evening, if you enjoyed it, whether or not we should do things like this in the future. Also, you'll notice that if you give us your email address and subscribe to our newsletter, which tells you about upcoming events at the library, you'll be entered into a raffle for a $100 Amazon gift card. Now, we like to joke that that would only buy you a third of a book here at LMU, but actually, tonight's speaker's uh, book will be on sale afterwards, and you can actually purchase two books with a $100 Amazon gift card. So buy one for yourself and buy one for your friend. Um, also, if you didn't already notice, students, we are swiping people in using LMU Leo, so if you want to get credit for attending this event, um, I'll have the swipe set up uh, after the event up here at the front, so just come find me. If you don't know what LMU Leo is, then don't worry about it. And um, finally, uh, this event is open to all, so please encourage uh, your friends and colleagues and family uh, to come to this event uh, in the future. This is our second. We have six more, one every month between now and the end of the spring semester. So, now um, allow me to um, welcome Amy Woodson Bolton, Associate Professor of History, who will introduce tonight's featured speaker. So, She Devil, Devil in the City of Angels is about that amazing period in the late 19th century when so many aspects of our own modern era took shape. But even as the mass press, department stores, police force, party politics, and real estate development transformed Los Angeles from a small town to a much bigger city, people tried to understand these new forms of urban life in the terms they already had. That is, the rhetoric of much earlier distinctions of race, class, and gender. In this disjunct disjunction between the rhetoric of true womanhood and the shop girl, manly honor, and local brothels filled with recent arrivals, older categories became unmoored and unstable. In this context, Victorian cultural forms rehearsed narratives that could be both reassuring and deeply unsettling as new audiences sought out art and literature that would reflect back at them both the complexity of their lives and offer measuring resolutions, reassuring resolutions. Engravings of genre painting, sensationalist literature, theatrical melodrama, and detective fiction sold to increasingly mass audiences. Newspapers competed for gruesome stories whose very sensationalism belied their claims to domestic purity, but whose morality tales and claims to revealing the truth or seeking justice justified their lurid explicitness. Professor Anzalotti's book leads us into this world in which working class men and women moved into new professions of uncertain respectability, like policemen, shop girls, and reporters, and in which young women could take the train from Peoria to Los Angeles and invent new identities. 
The case of Hattie Wolstein also illustrates just how situational justice was in the decades after the Civil War. Professor Anzalotti's detailed research shows us that the story of this murder appeared and constantly changed, as we will see, in the for-profit mass press, which operated through advertising revenue, hello Facebook, and that the outcome of Hattie's trial emerged through the intersection of many different competing interests. Catching and punishing a murderer was only one, and maybe the least important. <laughs> In the era of Me Too, this book made me think about how we are still haunted by the claims and choices that white, middle-class women made as they demanded a greater role in the public sphere. Early advocates for women's rights used essentialist definitions of femininity to establish their unique claims to virtue and morality. In that debate and the heated atmosphere of the fantasy of the city, the world of the dandy, the flaneur, and the flagrant prostitute, the questions of sexuality and women's social role became inextricably linked. The story of Hattie Wolstein, uh, the, the story of Hattie Wolstein illuminates all of these complexities in the same clear and engaging way that has made Professor Anzalotti such a beloved teacher and such an incredible recruiter of history majors. <laughs> <laughs> and so my most pressing question that I hope she answers tonight is, when's the movie coming out? Yeah. <laughs> Introduction. Um, she Devil in the City of Angels, Gender Violence and the Hattie Wolstein Murder Case in Victorian era Los Angeles. Thank you so much for coming and letting me tell you this amazing story. I appreciate it. Um, I want to begin by saying, though, that the book's title was not my invention. In fact, just before the publication, I attended a gathering of graduate, graduate school classmates. And I sensed a bit of shock, some unease, when I mentioned the title of my forthcoming work. And one friend leaned in and said, is that negotiable? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it was not, because the editor was particularly pleased with himself for his creativity. Um, I managed to sneak in the words gender and violence. <laughs> um, but in the publishing process, the author must know when to concede. On the morning of October 7, 1887, the charred remains of Los Angeles dentist Charles Harlan was discovered in a burned out barn in Compton. He had been bludgeoned, stabbed, shot in the head, and set on fire. The authorities immediately suspected foul play. <laughs> the prime suspect was a young woman named Hattie Wolstein, with whom it was rumored that the married Harlan had been having an affair. Hattie found herself facing a murder charge, as well as public scorn and outrage. She was dubbed Wicked Wolstein, the fiendish murderess, a she-devil. The crime and Hattie's subsequent trial captivated the public as few incidents had done before. Why was the murder of a philandering dentist so intriguing? Why was the idea of a female perpetrator so disturbing? The answers can be found in Victorian notions of class, gender, and sexuality. I came across a brief reference to Hattie and her troubles while researching the experiences of women in Southern California in the years following the Civil War a period of dramatic change in the region. During the decade of the 1880s, Los Angeles was on its way to becoming a metropolis. Its population expanded from roughly 11,000 in 1880 to more than 50,000 re residents by the end of the decade. Among those adding to this phenomenal growth were large numbers of women, many drawn by the area's economic opportunities, and others carried there by husbands and fathers, and determined to use their feminine influence to bring civilization to the West. I was interested in the ways that class and gender intersected and shaped the lives of these women. Did middle class and working class women share the same experience of settling in a frontier community? Or did class alter the, um, that experience for them? That's when I found Hattie. The story was so fascinating in all of its complexity that I was shocked to find that there was almost nothing written about it. I found a very brief summary 
fraught with errors. In an LA Times column from 1999, <laughs> LA then and now recounted the case of a murder, a mistress, and a scandalous trial. <laughs> the focus was exclusively on sensationalism, but without any context at all in which to understand this situation. I saw in the details of Hattie's arrest and the trial a lens through which to examine 19th century attitudes about working class women, a group that did not fit neatly into gender conventions. During the late 19th century, American society found itself grappling with the so-called woman question. Victorian society held that gender roles were fixed, that they were immutable, that nature had endowed men and women with completely distinct yet complementary character traits. One's gender, it was held, determined one's character, and likewise determines one, determined one's place in society. Industrialization produced profound changes in American society, not the least of which was the division of home and work into separate spheres. Men and women now inhabited and dominated these distinct spaces, supposedly endowed by nature with character traits that allowed them to flourish there. Men and women, it was understood, possessed opposite and complementary characteristics. Men were independent, assertive, <coughs> aggressive, self-interested, traits that served them well in the competitive world of business and politics. Women, in contrast, were gentle, passive, sympathetic, and nurturing, selfless, and completely dependent. They were also supposedly endowed with natural purity and piety, and were therefore not only morally superior to men, but uniquely qualified to serve as society's moral guardians. From the sanctuary of the domestic realm, the household, that shielded them from the corrupting influences of the public realm, they could employ their innate moral superiority to influence and temper the baser instincts of their husbands and their sons. But the late 19th century saw a rapid increase in the number of women entering the public domain. The new woman, of the era demanded the opportunity to play a role in society beyond the confines of the household. She wanted something more than marriage and motherhood. She sought an education. She wanted financial independence. She demanded gender equality. And here she is. <laughs> the new woman. This new woman, daughter of the middle class, challenged widely held expectations of female subordination. These new women saw themselves as men's equals, and they worked to overcome gender stereotypes. This is one of my favorite paintings. It's a John Singer Sargent portrait of Mr. and Mrs. I.N. Phelps Stokes. It was commissioned as a wedding gift, um, and the, the bride, it was supposed to be of the bride herself posed with her great dame. And the great dame refused to cooperate. Her husband stepped in. <laughs> um, she epitomizes everything about the new woman of the late 19th century. As you can see by her attire, um, which borrows from men's clothing, as you can see by her, her, po her body language, her posture, as you can see by the fact that she's stepped into the forefront and he's relegated to the shadows. So she is demanding gender equality. Now, these women were using their presumed moral superiority um, to give, them, give themselves a voice. And that, ex that expectation of female moral, fema sorry, female moral superiority al allowed for their activism as they found ways to expand the domestic sphere to include the whole community. So they begin to articulate that that, um, that, that the domestic realm fars, um, um, far, um, is much more expansive than just the household itself. That in fact the whole community is part of this larger household. And so they're using that kind of language um, to, to, um, 
to allow themselves this, this more public role. They were determined to use their supposedly innate moral superiority to foster social uplift and to see to the moral regeneration of society. And they found support for their activism through membership in reform organizations or in what had come to be regarded as women's professions, particularly teaching and nursing. A key target of their endeavors was the working class, mired as it was in poverty. And their particular anxiety was the plight of poor women. As young women entered the industrial workforce in increasing numbers, concern for their moral well-being grew. <laughs> These young female low-wage laborers, whose morals were supposedly less fully evolved than those of their middle-class counterparts, were feared to be women adrift easily drawn into the burgeoning sexual service sector in American cities due to lack of male support, economic need, seduction and betrayal, or simply temptation. The reality was that it was not unusual for working class women to engage in the sex trade temporarily. Los Angeles, like all American cities, had a flourishing sexual service sector, <clears throat> and working class women sometimes took advantage of the demand. For them, this was not a moral issue. It was an economic issue. Prostitution was one of a limited array of options for them and generally offered better earnings than can be garnered by working as a maid or in a shop or in a factory. Many saw the sex trade as an economic stepping stone, simply a way to improve their condition. The truth was that sex was profitable. But that truth was unsettling to many in the middle class, women in particular, who found it inconceivable that anyone would voluntarily engage in prostitution. Those who did, did so were thought to be victims, seduced and abandoned, tricked or forced into losing their, their virtue, clearly the victims of male lust to be pitied and rescued. But sex workers rejected reformers' views of them as victims. And most of them eventually left the sex trade to return to other avenues of employment or to marry. The anonymity of the city made it easy for them to move on to new locales, leave the sexual service sector behind, and lay claim to respectability. It was the fluidity with which they moved in and out of the trade that members of the middle class found deeply unsettling. <laughs> Middle class reformers viewed the plight of working class women as an obstacle to the introduction of a more humane maternal social order. Middle class women, seeking a greater measure of autonomy and real political voice for themselves, sought to break down the barriers of class in an effort to establish a sense of gender solidarity among all women. It seems that women enthusiastically crossed the class divide, separating middle class matrons from those in the working class in order to support Hattie Wolstein and to use her experience as a cautionary tale about gender inequality and the absolute necessity for moral reform. In fact, they paid for her lawyers. Within weeks of her arrest, Hattie's public image underwent a profound transformation. No longer a fiend, she was reimagined as a symbol of female victimization and the sexual double standard. Though the evidence against her was compelling, once she stood trial for the murder of Doc Harlan, the jury took just over 10 minutes to acquit her of the charge. <laughs> no longer a she-devil, she had become an unlikely champion of women's rights. The circumstances surrounding Charles Harlan's death, particularly the possibility of a female assailant, created a sensation. The desire for details was intense. In the 19th century, most people believed that murder was a crime committed almost exclusively by men. <clears throat> Women were far more often the victims than the perpetrators. And yet, when questioned by the chief of police, Hattie <coughs> Wolstein freely admitted that she had killed Doc Harlan. Her initial explanation was that it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> but that was only the first of many versions of the story. And as it turned out, Nothing was perfectly clear, and no one was who she or he seemed to be. 
It was widely known that Hattie and Harlow were lovers, and she was seen with him on the day of the murder. So the chief of police of the Los Angeles Police Department, a man named Patrick Darcy, brought her in for questioning. He did not believe her to be the guilty party, but he thought she might have important information to divulge, which she certainly did. <laughs> she provided a, a variety of possible scenarios regarding Harlan's death. When pressed for details, she told a tale of her despondent lover's suicide. <laughs> she claimed that while taking a buggy ride around the city, Harlan begged her to run away to Denver with him. When she refused his plea, he pulled a pistol out of his pocket and shot himself. Fearing the sound of the gunshot would draw attention and that she would be held responsible for Harlan's death, she determined to dispose of the body. Hattie described wrapping her right arm around his neck to hold the body upright to prevent too much blood from spilling on the, <laughs> the buggy floor. With her left hand, she took the reins and drove to Compton, 10 miles away, <laughs> to the abandoned ranch of an acquaintance. There, she pushed the dead man out of the vehicle onto the floor of the barn and covered him with straw, which she, she set ablaze. <laughs> In this first telling, Hattie was simply the hapless witness to Harlan's self-destruction. But Chief Darcy was unconvinced. How, he asked, had the right-handed dentist managed to shoot himself above his left ear? <laughs> <laughs> and while Harlan was not a big man, he was described as 5'7", about 140 pounds, her claim of managing that literal dead weight while covering a distance of 10 miles by buggy that would have taken about an hour that seemed rather dubious. Without a plausible explanation, Hattie changed her story. As she was questioned repeatedly by Chief Darcy and several of his officers, she provided variations of her narrative. The details changed with each retelling. In one version, when she refused Harlan's request to go with him to Denver, he pulled out the pistol to murder her. She begged for her life, and as they struggled over the gun, it discharged accidentally, striking Harlan in the head. She provided graphic details regarding his death. By his watch, which she stole, <laughs> it took 10 minutes for him to expire. She related it this way. She said, he kicked for a few minutes and then was dead. <laughs> she indicated that there was less blood than she feared as his head swelled profusely where the bullet entered. She described the corpse striking the buggy step as she dumped it out into the barn, which she claimed explained the bludgeon marks noted in the coroner's, the <laughs> coroner's report. Um, his arms and torso apparently were covered with circular bruises about an inch in diameter, leading the doctor who examined the remains to speculate that Harlan had been beaten with a hammer. <laughs> Another version of the events had Hattie admitting she killed him, as she said, in a heat of passion, when she found out that he was a married man. She claimed she did not mean to kill him, but aimed a pistol at him to demand that he divorce his wife and make good his promise of marriage. The story changed as it was told and retold. At one point, recounting two different versions of the events of October 6th, she asked one of Darcy's officers his opinion as to which narrative to offer at <laughs> a trial. <laughs> she inquired of him, now, Jeffries, which one is the most likely to tell effectively in court? <laughs> in each retelling, Hattie described her efforts to hide evidence of the shooting, sponging the blood off the buggy's wheels, cutting a small piece um, out of the buggy curtain when she was unable to remove a stain, remnants of what she believed was brain matter. Um, she described the excised fabric as a rectangular segment measuring two inches by four. She also admitted that in addition to taking Harlan's watch, she also took his watch chain with its diamond locket, his diamond ring, and his money. At her arraignment, Hattie provided yet another version of the incident. Now, as she and Harlan sat in the buggy in a eucalyptus grove on the outskirts of the city, she was so devastated upon learning that he was a married man that she drew a pistol 
claiming she, <clears throat> she intended to kill herself. She said that as he grabbed for the gun, it discharged accidentally, the bullet striking him in the head. This version <clears throat> introduced two accomplices to aid her in disposing of the body. <laughs> Hattie's sister, Minnie, and Minnie's lover, Willie Witts, which procured a wagon in which to transport Harlan's remains, then followed the sisters in the buggy to the abandoned Compton property. There they dragged the body into the, into the barn, doused it with kerosene, and set it ablaze. So, a tragic accident, not murder. By the time Hattie stood trial for Harlan's murder in April 1888, her lawyers had concocted an even more sympathetic version of the circumstances surrounding Harlan's death. Their aim was to settle on a narrative that would exonerate Hattie in the courtroom and redeem her in the court of public opinion. As they told it, on the night he died, Harlan and Hattie took a buggy ride to the deserted Compton Ranch. There, the new account revealed, the dentist attempted to rape her. They claimed that, in her despair over her disgrace, she drew a pistol to shoot herself. When Harlan grabbed for it, it discharged three times, <laughs> inflicting the fatal wound. Hattie then accidentally set fire to the barn when she lit a match to see Harlan's body in the darkness <laughs> and not in the straw. <laughs> The trouble with this storyline is that it was jeopardized by Hattie's confession to Chief Darcy and his officers. But Hattie's lawyers had already concocted details with which to discount that damning information. They insisted that Hattie's incriminating testimony was coerced, that Darcy threatened to rape her if she did not admit guilt. It was a charge designed specifically to throw the police investigation into complete disarray. And so, as the case went to trial, Hattie's image had been fully rehabilitated in the minds of many. Harlan was dismissed as a scoundrel who deserved his fate, and Chief Darcy emerged as the real villain in the drama. As it turns out, <clears throat> the dead man, Doc Harlan, though a dentist by trade, aspired to be a professional gambler. <laughs> it was rumored that he operated a skin game cheating at cards to fleece novice poker players. The LAPD reportedly was preparing to raid the game until Harlan turned up dead. He also bragged about his sexual exploits, including his affair with Hattie. And his dental assistant insinuated that Harlan sexually assaulted female patients while they were under anesthesia. So Harlan was not just a dentist and a gambler, but a libertine as well. Doc Harlan was not the only actor in this drama who had multiple identities. There were conflicting images of Hattie Wolstein to be grappled with as well. To some who knew her, Hattie was bold, fearless, a woman who, it was said, wouldn't whimper if the whole world was against her. This is a portrait that appeared in the 1888 version of um, of sort of a, a national crime yearbook called <laughs> Defenders and Offenders. <laughs> so Hattie made the class of 1888. <laughs> so to some, she was bold and fearless. To others, she was the frail victim of male aggression in need of sympathy and protection. Harlan believed her to be quite wealthy. He, he um, in fact, um, uh, claimed that she was the daughter of a cattle king. He claimed he was transacting real estate purchases on her behalf, that she had plenty of money and he could get all he wanted of it. When she arrived in Los Angeles, Hattie crafted a personal narrative that suggested a genteel upbringing and social respectability, claiming to be supported by regular infusions of cash from wealthy relatives. She also indicated that she planned on becoming a teacher reinforcing that narrative of middle-class respectability. In fact, Hattie was the oldest child of a bricklayer from Peoria, Illinois. She and her sister Minnie departed their hometown for parts west, precipitated by the theft of a watch. <laughs> the father paid for the watch and hustled them out of town. 
Their travels brought them eventually to Los Angeles, where they briefly worked as maids before moving on to a downtown boarding house and the company of a large number of gentlemen callers, one of whom was Doc Harlan. So many men visited the sisters' room at the house on Fort Street, which is now Broadway, that their landlady, irritated, raised the rent. <laughs> the Wolstein fit sisters fit a pattern, not uncommon for working, for working class women in the late 19th century, moving as they seem to have done from domestic service to prostitution to marriage. It was the anonymity of the city that allowed for that type of personal reinvention. This is um, Spring Street in downtown Los Angeles um, in 1888. Um, and so this is the, 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 the moment at which Los Angeles was really beginning to explode in terms of population um, and, uh, and, and um, economic opportunity. Um, the building in the, in the center left is the People's Store. Charles Harlan ran his skin game from the, the upper floors of the People's Store. The Hattie Wolstein who first came to the public's notice was bold and assertive. She was the epitome of the new woman. But as she stood accused of murder, she retreated into gendered conformity, altering her per persona to reflect the image that society desired to see. At her trial, she dressed modestly and stylishly in dark colors, her face obscured by a dark veil. More tellingly, she wore her hair in a long braid draped over her shoulder that hung to her waist. This was a particularly deliberate and artful piece of imagery, meant to invoke the, Im the innocence of youth. During the 19th century, only girls wore their hair in braids. Women wore their hair pil pulled up in chignon, off their shoulders and away from their faces. A girl put her hair up for the first time in her mid-teens as a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. Hattie, with her hair down, presented herself as a child in need of support and sympathy. If Hattie was to be rehabilitated in the public's mind, she had to be reimagined as a victim and someone had to play the part of villain. That fell to the chief of police. It was Darcy's dogged pursuit of the case against her that damned him in the eyes of the public. Resentment against him gave way to his complete vilification. The public demanded Hattie's innocence and his refusal to let the matter go. He couldn't, after all. He knew what she had confessed to him and his officers. Um, but the public's, um, uh, the public's demand for her innocence, his refusal to let the matter go, led to his downfall. If gender convention was to remain unchallenged, then Hattie must be innocent. If she was guilty, then everything Victorian society thought it knew about gender was wrong. A guilty verdict would demand a reappraisal of society's firmly held beliefs about gender, that, major, that nature made the sexes completely distinct. Hattie branded a murderer meant that she must possess a masculine character. And if she had manly traits, other women might also. And therefore, men might harbor feminine characteristics. And that was profoundly unsettling. That possibility would be a world turned upside down, and the public demanded to be shielded from such a forced reappraisal. The stakes were high, and Darcy and Justice lost. Darcy was decried as either hyper-masculine, a symbol of toxic masculinity, or completely emasculated. Both were at odds with his reputation before the murder. Then, uh, but before the, the, this case came to light, he was regarded as a firm, courageous man and an experienced officer. But his refusal to allow a more palata palatable narrative to be told about Doc Harlan's death made him a transgressor against public opinion. And therefore, he became an easy target. Someone had to take the fall. If Hattie's confession was to be dismissed, 
those who heard it must be discredited. The campaign began with Darcy. Then his officers, one by one, were branded as criminals, incompetents, and fools. The press led the charge. During the 19th century, journalistic, journalistic objectivity was neither demanded nor delivered. The press's role was as much to entertain as to present the facts. <clears throat> Journalism as a profession was a late 19th century innovation, and those engaged in it were not troubled by any conflict between truthfulness and entertainment. But the urban press also served a crucial function, creating a community out of a diverse population of city residents. In reading the news, city dwellers could share a common vision of the urban landscape and embrace a common identity. Newspapers told readers not just what to think about, but also how to, thi how to think about the information presented. This was a forum for city dwellers to experience community in a setting in which face-to-face -face interaction was becoming increasingly limited. Los Angeles boasted four daily newspapers in the 1880s, and all of them covered the story of the body in the barn extensively. It had all of the ingredients newspapermen could desire. Mystery, violent crime, illicit sex, ample opportunity for embellishment and speculation, entertainment, and an edifying lesson to be imparted to an eager audience, ensuring that readers understood how they were supposed to think about the crime, the trial, and its outcome. Um, the story gained such notoriety that there was a, a national interest in it. And Hattie actually made the cover of the National Police Gazette in November of 1887. The, um, the tagline under the illustration, she tried to cremate him. <laughs> so, uh, the newspapers told their audience the story readers longed to hear, that a woman could not possibly be capable of wanton violence. That explains the aggressive assault on Darcy's character. He had to be proclaimed, at least temporarily, the villain in order for Hattie to be portrayed as the victim the public so longed for her to be. The legal system abetted public opinion. During the 19th century, the law was a malleable thing, often bowing to community sentiment. The criminal justice system pitted the letter of the law against the public's expectations, ultimately allowing for an outcome the community desired. Patty's lawyers certainly understood that. They crafted a narrative that would resonate with the public, that would gratify social sensibilities. They knew how to concoct a scenario that would elicit sympathy for their client and gain the public's approval in spite of the facts. They knew, too, that the case against her was also a case against Victorian beliefs about gender and character. Middle class values and ideals themselves were at stake. Victorian sensibilities relied on truths, and an, an, an impregnable gender divide was one of those. The public was determined to cling to the cultural conviction that a woman, by virtue of her gender, could not possibly possess the agency to commit murder. Hattie's lawyers consciously groomed her to play the part of sympathetic defendant. The story told in court fit neatly within the bounds of gender convention. That Hattie shot Harlan accidentally when she brandished a pistol at when he when she brandished a pistol as he attempted to rape her. His fate was therefore well deserved. Male sexual predation was regarded as particularly dangerous to an orderly society, and it was feared to be on the rise. As a result of that anxiety, during the 19th century, the so-called unwritten law exonerated a man accused of murder committed to avenge a woman's honor. Manly virtue required an aggressive response to any assault on womanly virtue. Juries routinely acquitted men of killing the sub seducers of their wives, daughters, or sisters, believing that their actions were justified. 
Manliness called for the protection of female virtue by any means. But what was regarded as an act of chivalry when undertaken by a man was, dreamed mere, was deemed mere criminality when the assailant was a woman. Women were constrained by a sexual double standard. In response to that fact, outspoken female reformers openly supported the application of the unwritten law to women standing accused of assault against the men who had seduced them. This, to 19th century feminists, was a case of women's rights. The public balked at the notion of a woman acting on her own behalf to redress her grievances and restore her honor through violence. The fear was that given such license, any woman would have, the license, would have license to extract, uh, exact revenge on any man who she argued had done her wrong. Mayhem would ensue. <laughs> In light of that anxiety, therefore, Hattie's narrative did not imagine her actively av avenging herself. Rather, she was simply the victim of circumstances she could not control. The all-male jury standing in judgment of Hattie Goldstein understood that in certain regards, truth is irrelevant. They considered the competing versions of the facts presented at Hattie's trial and arrived at a verdict in line with cultural convention. They looked beyond the law and weighed the evidence against societal expectations and values. They applied community norms to their judgment and those norms insisted that a woman could not be guilty of premeditated murder. The men tasked with deciding Hattie's fate employed jury nullification, setting aside the evidence to render the verdict that they desired and that the public expected. <clears throat> the jury returned to the packed courtroom just over 10 minutes after they left and declared Hattie Woolstein innocent. The room erupted in enthusiastic applause. The large crowd gathered in the street outside cheered. The public had been vindicated. The people were secure in their truth. In fact, it did not matter what the truth was, who the real Hattie Woolstein was, or Charles Harlan, or Patrick Darcy. It did not matter who killed Doc Harlan. Her acquittal meant that the public's shared truth about gender and character could remain at least temporarily unchanged. The point was that Hattie was a stock character in a Victorian melodrama, telling us more about the audience and the values they held so dear than providing any sort of factual clarity or certainty. The ultimate truth was that upholding the black and white letter of the law was far more threatening than letting a young woman get away with murder. Hattie Wolstein's trial for the murder of Charles Harlan turned gender roles upside down. Her social, her social redemption restored, at least temporarily, the longed for certainty regarding gender in Victorian America. Now there is a, there's a, a, a bit of an epilogue to her story. In June of 1895, the Los Angeles Herald printed a letter that had been presented to them by, by a, 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 a local gambler named William Holland. They printed the letter in full, and it read, Old friend Will, I am married, and there is peace for me at last. Mr. Austin, whose wife I became on the 2nd of May, is an engineer on the CCCNI Railroad. <coughs> he is here with me and sends love. We are all well and happy. The letter was signed, your friend, Hattie Wolstein Austin. Mm. But guess what? That's not the truth either. The <gasps> truth either. In fact, according to family records, Hattie married a man named George Perry <laughs> in Peoria in 1891. And they moved to San Francisco where she must have accidentally run into William Holland because he was residing in the city at that time too, and he recognized her. Mm. And so the letter was designed to ensure that anyone looking for Hattie Austin would be looking for the wrong person in the wrong place. Helen Perry 
could now be invisible. So, I thank you. So, open for questions? Yeah, absolutely. All right, who's got a question? My question is just, did you ever discover her motivation? Or is there any hint to her motivation? What precipitated the murder? Assuming she did it, of course. Um, <laughs> if, she, if she didn't murder him herself, she was standing, you know, you know, standing there in front of him when he was killed. Because she provided such grotesque specificity regarding his death and the condition of the body. Um, I think that this was a simple con. Hattie Wilson was a con artist. Charles, Charles Harlan was a con artist. And when two con artists sit out to con one another, somebody ends up dead. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your amazing research with us. That was really fascinating to hear. And to see it explored through the lens of gender, it was uh, really enlightening. Um, my question is, whatever happened to Police Chief Darcy? So, by the time she went to trial, Darcy was no longer Chief of Police. Now, that's not particularly unusual because um, policing was in its infancy, basically, at, in this period. The LAPD was only established in the mid-1870s. Um, Charles Darcy was um, the 11th man to hold that post, so from... 1876 to 1888, there had been 11 chiefs of police. Um, most of them were discharged for um, negligence because um, policing was, it, um, it, 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 there was no training for these people. It was just another avenue for gainful <coughs> employment. Uh, most of the men who served with Darcy on the police force, um, as he did, um, came west with the railroads. They were former railroad workers. Um, and this was just another, uh, another means of gainful employment. Um, the fact that Darcy worked, to, you know, worked his way up, he, um, he had been with the railroads, um, had worked in construction in LA, served um, on the, the county um, sheriff's force as a captain for several years, and was very highly regarded in that capacity, which is why he was tapped then to take the, the, um, the position of chief on the LAPD when the man who preceded him was discharged for incompetence. Um, but basically, he was appointed to finish out that man's term, which ran until January. And in January, when the police commissioners um, you know, uh, were determining you know, whether to reappoint him or not, they actually gave the position to someone else. So he wasn't discharged for cause, necessarily. Though, of course, the fact that people were already expressing dissatisfaction with his handling of the case you know, uh, didn't, you know, didn't help him. After his stint as police chief he, and, and his virtual destruction you know, in, by the press, he never recovered. Uh, his reputation never really um, you know, uh, you know, came back to where it had been. He was, he was never redeemed in the public's mind. He tried a number of different um, economic ventures, but each time he, re he met with disappointment and sometimes ridicule. Um, and he died at 58 uh, in the year 1900. He's buried in East Los Angeles. I wondered what your sources were. Is there a transcript of a recorded transcript of the testimony? And a related question is, how did you come to your conclusions about um, credibility? When, in the process of researching the book, did you reach the gender determinations that you did, and what caused you to do so? Um, first of all, in terms of sources, um, there is a very incomplete um, um, transcript of trial testimony. Um, it's housed at um, um, Cal State Northridge, but it, it is, it is um, you know, very partial. The benefit, though, was that I could use that 
to gauge the veracity of, um, of the, the information being provided in the press. Because um, the newspaper, these four newspapers, um, you know, were at the trial daily, and they basically provided the public with sort of a blow-by-blow -blow of all the testimony. So I could use the official transcript, that, that small portion of it, to, to basically gauge, is the press getting it right? Um, and, they, and they were, um, aside from, you know, from you know, their own you know, bit, bits of sensationalism, the transcripts that they provided were pretty accurate when I compared the two sources. Um, now, in, in terms of my, my views about Hattie and her culpability, um, if you look at the whole trajectory of, of her life, um, it speaks to a young woman who is determined to chart her own path and play by her own rules, but in, at various stages it includes um, you know, engaging in various cons, um, a number of thefts. At one point, she's, she and Minnie were in San Francisco, and they visited a jeweler's. And they were admiring a pair of diamond earrings. Said that that you know they really liked the earrings. They'd be back later because they were waiting for an infusion of cash from their wealthy father at home. Their next stop was around the corner to a pawn shop, where they attempted to pawn the diamond rings they had just stolen from the jeweler. <laughs> so the owner of the pawn shop said he'd be happy to loan them the money on the rings, but he needed to figure out oh, the, the earrings, but he needed to figure out what they might be worth. So he'd be right back, and he walked around the corner to the jeweler. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were arrested. <laughs> they told a tale of woe that they were penniless and friendless in the city. They were starving. All they wanted to do was to get back to their family in Peoria. So the Boys and Girls Club <laughs> buys train tickets for them, <laughs> which they cashed in. <laughs> headed on to Los Angeles. Um, so they, 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 they left a trail behind them um, of rather nefarious activities. Um, so that, that told me right away that there's, there's more to this than you know, a simple story of you know, a crime of passion, right? That, you know, that, that that, that Doc Harlan you know, seduced Hattie by pretending to be a bachelor um, you know, and promise, with promises of marriage, and only once she finds out that he's actually a married man, you know, does, does she, does she you know, kill him you know, out of, out of her, her, you know, her rage and you know, that this was about a broken heart. Um, there's so much more about her behavior that said to me, that's, that's, not, what, that's not what this story was about at all. Um, and so that, that's why I came to the conclusion that, that, you know, that, that this was a con gone bad. Um, I'm not convinced she didn't have an accomplice. Um, in fact, it's likely that, that, um, that another gambler might have actually uh, been with her, that she, that she probably lured Harlan to his death. The day he died, he received a note from her in, his de in the dental office thing that, where she demanded that he must come see her this evening, and she was emphatic. And he mentioned to his dental assistant that he thought that was odd. Um, so my suspicion is that she lured him to his death, that the gamblers all knew that he carried a large amount of money with him. His wife, in, in fact, said that he routinely carried 800 or or $1,000 in cash. Um, and so uh, I think this was a payback for gambling losses and robbery. So, no, sorry, we got a question oh, right okay. here. Hi, Professor Anzalotti. Um, <laughs> do you personally see Hattie as more of a symbol for women's right or as a murderer or both? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I see her as a murderer, and I, <laughs> and I see her as, in fact, almost um, undermining this quest for women's rights. Um, because the the you know the the notion of uh, you know of a female perpetrator um, really undermined the the, the 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 key argument that women made in favor of gender equality 
and their rights, which was their innate moral superiority. And so if young women could be running around you know, having affairs with married men and then killing them for their money, um, that, really, um, that really diminished then that justification for women's rights, this notion of, you know, of, of women's moral suasion and their ability to, to rehabilitate society. She was basically doing the opposite. So I recall you saying that the journalists who covered this story were men. Yes. Okay. With, with a powerful exception. Oh. There, okay, so I'm interested to hear about that, but I'll ask you my question and then let you talk about both things. Okay. <laughs> so my question is, why do you think all these men didn't realize that Darcy was a, the police chief was a victim here? That's a great question. And the answer, I think, is pretty straightforward, and it's that, that that's an inconvenient truth. Mm -hmm. um, the public demands their truth, which is that a woman cannot possibly have that kind of agency, <coughs> that she could not possibly um, you know, engage in wanton criminality to that degree. Darcy knew what he knew about her, um, but the fact that he wouldn't bow to public pressure and let the matter go um, the, you know, the, you know the, the press led the charge in demonizing him. But this is very interesting. The day after the acquittal, the Los Angeles Times printed um, basically a retraction and actually came out and said, well, the story she told about Darcy, nobody can believe that because no one has ever questioned his character before. So they spend you know, months tearing him down and demonizing him only to say, oh, never mind. <laughs> um, but it was too late for Darcy. He, he, you know, his reputation never recovered. And um, was that also a man, that journalist? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the woman journalist, her name was Belle Mead Smith. And she um, authored um, a, a specifically a women's column in the LA Times. And she had nothing good to say about Hattie Wolstein. <laughs> um, she criticized everything about her, including her looks. Well, she's rather coarse and far too freckled. Um, so, so, um, and, and there were other women who, who wrote, you know, wrote letters to the editor, um, basically saying that you know there should be no sympathy for her. That she, you know, one woman basically, you know, came right out and said, you know, well, why would she we have any sympathy for the drab of a married man? A drab would be basically a slut. Um, so, so women, uh, so, so some women supported her vociferously, and others condemned her just as loudly. They, men, on the other hand, all rallied around her. A woman in need of protection. I was just wondering, do you know exactly how many different stories or variations of the same story of the murder that she gave? <laughs> um, she gave at least six. Um, and, 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 and some of them are variations. You know, she's riffing off of stories she's, she's already told. And others are just, she, you know, she's just making up new material as she goes along. Um, but it's almost as though she's rehearsing each time she tells a story, gauging the reception, and then comes right out and says to Sergeant Jeffries, so what do you think? Which, which one do you think will play better to the, the audience, who's the jury, right? Uh, my question is regarding uh, Mrs. Harlan, Doc Harlan's wife. Whatever happened to her, and what did she think about all this? Um, she insisted initially that, um, that yes, she, she knew that, that, that her husband was acquainted with Hattie Wolstein, claiming that he was um, transacting business for her, you know, this, these real estate purchases, supposedly, that this was strictly a business relationship. Um, she appeared in court once um, during, during the inquest to, you know, to, to make that argument, and then immediately left the city. Um, there was no sympathy extended to her at all from the women who stepped forward to pay for Hattie's high-priced lawyers and such. Um, and I suspect it's because they, they damned her, Mary Harlan, for failing in her duty as a wife. She had not curbed the baser instincts of her husband, <laughs> as, she, as she should have as a Victorian matron. And her failure to do so, he's a 
know, she knew she was, she knew he was a gambler. She knew he was you know cheating at cards. Um, her failure to curb his baser instincts meant that she lost any sympathy she might have been due otherwise, and there was none extended to her. So, like one or two more questions. <coughs> um, <clears throat> Dr. Anglotti, you said something that sort of struck me and brought me back to contemporary times. You said, 12 men on a jury found the truth to be irrelevant. And I can't think of a better example than the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh and how that today is the promotion and maintenance of male toxic masculinity. What I'm saying is, in 2018, Kavanaugh got away with it. Male masculinity won. Could Hattie Wolstein get away with it in 2018? <laughs> That's, another question. That's a really good question. I'm slowly um, coming to get the answer. <laughs> um, <No>. Yes. <laughs> I, I, think she, I think she would. Um, because, as, 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 the, as the LA Times summed up in, 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 in their, you know, their, the, the, you know, their bit of coverage about her acquittal, well, she told such a plausible story. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. Who tells the better story? We want our truth, and we want it to be absolute. We want it in black and white. Who tells the better story? Um, and she played it masterfully. All right, final question. This is the real quick uh, question. Uh, so it seems to me as though that she had, she, she had this history of crime already, so like, what other crimes did she commit at, you know, uh, traveling throughout the United States? Because it seems interesting, because it seems that she used the idea of women at that time as these morally, object these morally objective individuals in order to easily get away with a lot of crimes. So, so what else did she do? Um, it, was, it was rumored that she had had a child out of wedlock while in Peoria, and that that was no another reason to, to, to leave town. Um, but mo most of her crimes... Um, were of a rather specifically gendered nature before the murder. Theft, right, and theft of jewelry, um, and prostitution. Um, so in that regard, she was fairly con conventional based upon society's fears about working class women. It reminds me of the idea of, you know, a woman's weapon is poison in the sense of, like, mm -hmm. a, this backwards, this, like, behind-the-scenes conniving woman using her race or using her position as a woman, especially in the society such as a Victorian era society, in order to get away with more things because, you know, that's what society just allows it to happen as obvious at the end of the trial. So yeah, so 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 um, she 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 fit neatly into society's anxieties mm -hmm. about working class women, these women adrift, yeah. but she was also shrewd enough to understand that the anonymity of the city could allow her this opportunity to reinvent herself yeah. and lay claim to Victorian respectability. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. for your time. I encourage everyone to continue asking questions if you have additional questions. Um, also a reminder that we have copies for sale up here from the bookstore. I will say that um, in the three years that I've been here, this is the first faculty pub night that I've read cover to cover. And I highly recommend it. It's a great work of scholarship, and it's a very enjoyable read. Um, so please. Yeah, mine was a real book. Yeah, walk, I walked into that one. I got it. Um, in any case, thank you all for coming out. Again, please come and ask additional questions, and give us your feedback. Thank you.